So I want to say welcome to everybody from wherever you're coming from, how late it might be. Uh, thanks for tuning in. We're going to talk a little bit about imperialism. We're going to talk about migration. And we're going to talk about causes, consequences, and all that good stuff. So without any further ado, we will go ahead and get started. So small introductions. Uh, if you haven't streamed with me before, uh, my name is Mr. Little. I teach AP World History at a high school just outside of the Bay Area in California. And I've been doing it for about five years now, and it's the absolutely the best thing ever. I love it. Um, I do, tell you, we tend to go through the presentation pretty pretty quickly. There'll be some pauses, some practice questions. I'll occasionally throw questions out to you guys. If you ever have any questions about something I've said, it doesn't make sense, you know, what, is, what did he just mean? I, I was lost. You can feel free at any time to go ahead and just ask me any questions that you like. That's A-OK. -okay. <clears throat> so, without any further ado, let's go ahead and get started. As always, uh, follow us. Think Fiveable. Stay up to date. We're always doing trivia games. We're doing essay practice. We're creating content study guides. Um, there's just some real great content creators on this team. We've got some great educators. Um, one of whom is with us here today. Eric is just the best, and Melissa as well. So uh, we got some great content creators always striving to make sure we make the best stuff. So follow us, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, and of course at fiveable.com, always. So here is the schedule of kind of what we're going to look at today. We're just going to quick go over some general, some just some general stuff about imperialism, a little some questions about it. What does it mean? Where is it? Um, and then we're going to talk about some causes. Uh, we're going to go three causes in particular, kind of break it down one at a time. We'll have a chance to practice an SAQ, an SAQ question and a multiple choice question related to imperialism. And then we'll talk a little bit about migration, which is one of the consequences of the imperial age. And then um, if there's any teachers out there, I always end these with um, some suggestions for how teachers can approach this in their own classroom. So. If there's any teachers out there, stay tuned to the end. We've got some good stuff for you, not to worry. All right. So, first question, imperialism. What is it? When I first learned this word, and I was in high school, and I was learning about the great age of imperialism, my first thought was um, I, I went to Star Wars because that's the first time I'd ever heard the language of empire, you know, to describe the empire. Darth Vader and the stormtroopers, Sometimes they called them imperial troopers. And so I always thought, oh, imperial means like, you know, it's some weird futuristic term from a, from a sci-fi movie. But as it turns out, that wasn't a bad way to go um, in terms of, of describing the kind of government and the kind of worldview uh, that existed during this time. And so the imperialism that we're talking about, uh, the kind of imperialism that you learn about in AP World is, is sort of a shift from a time it's kind of a, a turning point in history. Before the Imperial Age, you sort of have, and probably some of you have seen this in the course of your study, uh, you had a system where in, in Afro-Eurasia, you had roughly a balance between the three, three major world systems, if you will. You had uh, the Middle East and India. In the middle, you had China, and it's sort of the, the Chinese world, which includes like Korea and Vietnam and Japan. Uh, in the e east of that and then west of that, you had Europe plus Europe's colonies in America, which raises the interesting question of, you know, if there are already colonies in the Americas, when does this age really begin? But you sort of had a, a balance. You sort of had this balance, if you will, um, between these three regions. And what begins and what occurs and what we're going to talk about today is how we go from this this sort of balance between the regions uh, to a situation where Europe and then later on the United States and then later on Japan um, really do form the political and economic hearts of the world. Uh, they begin to physically bend the world to their will. Now, that is not to say that every part of the world was under their control and every part of the world uh, sought to adopt and become part of these empires, but uh, their influence was very strong. And this is partially why we call it the age of imperialism. It's because there was an imperial worldview. Empire was good, right? And you wanted to have a powerful state, you needed an empire. And so this is sort of the transition 
um, from the old colonial days in the Americas uh, into a new sort of age of empire, if you will. So that's where we're going to look there. How do you get there, though? And that's what we're exploring today is kind of how do we get there? How do we, how do we get to that? Um, and that's what we're going to talk about. Any thoughts really quick? I haven't given you the three things I'm going to talk about, but any guesses on how you get to this point in human history? Hmm, Tanya says the need for new stuff. Well, yeah, new stuff is nice. I, I wouldn't argue against new stuff. Larry says greed. Sabrina says goods. Dakota, I hope I'm pronouncing Dakota. Sorry if I'm pronouncing that wrong. Um, resources, that's sort of, that's a little more specific. Yeah, that's, that's sort of what we were looking for. Um, Maria says raw materials. Yes, that's the big one. That's that's that is probably one of the overarching ones, but there are a few others. So let's go ahead and take a quick look. And yet, before we even look at that, we sort of have to get some vocabulary down. And so one of the vocabulary words that does in fact have to do with resources. These are some must-know vocab that's going to be um that's going to be important throughout this, we're going to use these terms. Um, so for example, the Maxim gun, which is not, the Maxim gun is sometimes called the very first machine gun. That's not technically true, but it's the first widely used uh, machine gun. Some people might have heard of something called the Gatlin gun, which is a kind of machine gun that came before the Maxim gun, but it was not widely used. Um, Social Darwinism is something we're going to talk about. It's actually one of those causes. Um, and essentially what it is, is it's the evolutionary theory of Charles Darwin, which if you're, you know, if you're in bio, you might have heard of this theory, the theory of evolution. You probably have a better grasp on it. Um, but it's that theory uh, applied to cultures and nations. The idea that we're going to take the, the evolutionary theory and apply it to cultures and nations. And uh, right off the bat, you might see how that's a little problematic, but we'll, we'll talk about that. Um, <clears throat> guano, guano, which you might've heard of. It's, uh, it's fossilized animal droppings. Um, funny thing is though, it's really high in, in, in nitrous and phosphorus, which makes it really good fertilizer. And so we're gonna talk about literally the hunt for animal poop, as, as important as it was. And last but not least, we have this term that you also might be slightly familiar with. Uh, it's called an indentured servant. Now, if you took U.S. history, maybe in middle school or as a freshman, this term might be a little bit familiar with you. It is indentured servants played a large part in early American history as workers who um, signed a contract to come from Europe to the New World, and they would work for a set number of years, and then they would uh, eventually receive their freedom. They were kind of like bounded labor, basically, for the set number of years in their contract. Uh, but this institution is still here and around during this time, and we're going to talk about it. Awesome. So one of the big questions about the Imperial Age, before we even get to the causes of it, is when does it begin? And this is kind of a big question because your unit begins in 1750, right? That's officially when unit, unit, unit six is dated 1750 to 1900. But if we were going to look for a single event in human history, um, which of these would be the event? And the reason I've included these three events is because different authors that I've read on the topic of imperialism each cite one of these events as the beginning, if you will, of the age of contemporary imperialism. And so I've thrown these up there to show that when the age of imperialism begins is sort of a perspective thing. Um, but I'm curious what you guys think. Uh, which of these would you guess has perhaps been the, would be arguably the, the most important cause, or sorry, not the most important cause, the most important beginning point the most important starting point, if you had to pick one. And just to clarify, um, when a EIC stands for East India Company, and that's um, the British East India Company, uh, 
defeating the Mughal Empire at Palasi in India. Logan says Napoleon, East India Company, East India Company. Also Napoleon, another vote for Napoleon. Seems like a tie between those two. The Monroe, we've got one vote for the Monroe Doctrine. Um, you might be familiar with the first two. I'll just quick clarify the Monroe Doctrine. It more applies to the United States, but it is important because it was essentially the U.S. going out and saying that South America is is sort of our dominion. This is a nineteen. This is an 1823. A very young United States, basically telling Europe that South America belongs to us, uh, not to colonize, to protect, um, but nonetheless, sort of this 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 establishment that South America was America's, the United States' backyard. So it's an interesting question because we should always, when we talk about these dates, it should always be kind of a question of why this time period, why not a different time period? It plays into the perspective question. That's a big part of AP World. So, all righty. Let's talk about those causes. I've, I've held it up long enough. So, Three of the biggest causes, if you will, the, the pillars of the imperial age, uh, the two of you, two have already been hinted at, um, would be the demand for resources and markets. Um, military technology does play a really big role. Uh, and that kind of goes hand in hand with industrialization because you can't produce a lot of military technology if you don't have factories to do as such. And a third one that you, you may not be familiar with, and we're gonna delve into that one first, would be what we call the racial ideologies, uh, the racial ideologies of 19th century Europe. Um, you could call it racism, um, and that would not be a bad phrase to use, um, but it's, it was a little more than just racism in the sense that it was, it was an entire worldview. That's why I would call it racial ideologies and, and maybe not just racism because it was more than just racism, it was an entire worldview um, that we're gonna go ahead and delve into. And Tanya asks, is that why the Maxim gun is a key vocabulary word? Yes, that, the, the Maxim gun, I'm gonna talk about a very specific episode with the Maxim gun that, um, that it, it illustrates why it's so important. Um, and yes, Eric is completely correct. Maxim gun would be good evidence in an essay if you needed to talk about technology. And we'll get some other ones up there. We'll, we'll talk a little bit about some other ones. Uh, we'll, we'll get to that. So let's first touch base on the, the racial ideologies. There's a lot of text here. Um, I don't, if you're taking notes, if you don't have to copy all of this. Um, but I just want a quick kind of rundown because this, this may be the one that I feel like students traditionally are a little not so familiar with. Um, so these are a series of ideas and there are a lot of overlapping ideas, but but basically at the heart of it all, is this idea of a civilizational hierarchy, right? There are civilized people and there are non-civilized people. And what maybe sets this apart from previous iterations where, for example, during the first age of colonialism in the Americas, the Spanish might have differentiated themselves from say the Mexica uh, by nature of their Christianity. Now the civilization was ranked based on someone's skin color and or race or skull size, depending on which thinker you were talking to. So it's just some sort of a key difference. There have always been efforts to to rank or sort people, uh, but this time it, it was now based on what we might modern, as modern day conceive as race or skin color. Uh, Dakota says, my teacher told me that the Jungle Book was originally social Darwinism or how the British were above the Indians. You know, that's that's actually interesting. I am I haven't read the Jungle Book, and I've actually never seen the movie either. Um, so I am not entirely sure. Um, but that maybe that is because we actually are going to talk about Kipling. We're going to talk about Kipling, who wrote the Jungle Book. Um, but I'm not entirely sure about that Jungle Book. Uh, Sabrina says, "Did this religion of the thinker affect?" the thoughts that they spread. Um, there may have been some of that. You should definitely watch the movie. Yes, I will. Um, Sabrina, if I'm understanding your question correctly, um, the big thinkers, the big thinkers that sort of are, were the, the proponents of these ideologies were usually Christian. 
Um, most of them were Northern and Western Europeans, so they were probably Protestant. Um, you make an interesting point because historically there have been some Christians who opposed this kind of thing, Bartholomew de las Casas most famously. Um, but I think, I think the answer is probably no, but that's a very good question. Kid, didn't Kipling write The White Man's Burden? Yes, he did. And we are going to talk about that in just a second. Um, and so how do you, what, one of the big things is, you know, so why was racism and we know it invented in this time period? Well, there's a couple things. One is Charles Darwin's theory provides a very nice, uh, a very nice foundation for it to grow on. Um, and one of the other things are some of these Enlightenment era thinkers. Um, oh, darn, I misspelled Montesquieu's name there. Um, that's an embarrassing typo. Um, some of the Enlightenment thinkers also described what we would call racial hierarchies. For them, it was a natural thing and a good thing um, that people would be separated by their race and that uh, thinkers in Europe were just naturally a little more superior to, say, thinkers in other parts of the world. Um, not all Enlightenment era thinkers thought this. Um, there was famously Arthur Schopenhauer, who was really big on Buddhism. He was a huge um, Buddhist uh, stu student of Buddhism. Um, but really, there's these, these ideologies are a product of their time. That's kind of the point I'm getting at. Nationalism similar to patriotism. That is, uh, that is the million dollar question. <laughs> That's the million dollar question. Um, I'll just give the answer that I would give because I've been asked that question a few times. Um, nationalism is patriotism on overkill. That would be my answer to that question. But they both, um, they both do involve love of country. That's true. Didn't colonialism start a lot of conflicts? Yes, there were many colonial wars. That's true. Between the colonial powers and within colonies themselves. Um, okay. Let's take a look at, since somebody mentioned the white man's burden, let's take a look at that really quick. So this is a, a comic, if you will, a comic of um, the same title, the white man's burden, which sort of epitomizes what the white man's burden was talking about the topic. I, mean, I didn't put the text. I linked the text in the resources of the stream. So if you'd like to look at it, you can. Um, but this comic really embodies uh, a lot of the big ideas. Um, it's from a magazine called Judge in the United States. Um, and what I'd like you to do is just take a minute. We'll just take a minute and take a look at this and you know, tell me what you see. What do you see here? Because there's a lot of, it's a lot of imagery going on here. And just go ahead and just take a look at this and tell me what you see, and then we'll, we'll break down some of the things that are there. So we'll just go ahead and take a minute. Let's see the question. Okay, wow, a lot of great contributions. Um, so let's see. Literally, if we look on here. Uh, like, what do we literally see? Um, Melissa says that they're stepping on. Oh, she says, notice what they are stepping on. Yeah, what are they stepping on? Uncle Sam has a red armband cross, uh, a red cross on his armband. So maybe that implies that he's helping. There are two white gentlemen carrying baskets. And who's in the baskets? Um, Dakota says a group of people like Asians and people that may be stereotypical representations of Africans. Um, 
somebody from India, someone from China. And Carla points out that it looks like they're heading towards civilization. Yeah, so if you look at the top, you can see um, literally that the structure of the top says civilization, right? And so I'm gonna draw your attention to just a few things. Um, Melissa pointed out that these rocks down here, they literally have these words written on them like vice, ignorance, superstition, brutality, oppression, barbarism, right? And I think as Dan is alluding to, doesn't it show white people trying to modernize non-Europeans? I think it, it's literally, you can see that Uncle Sam, and this is, this is a character called John Bull, which is sometimes used as like a metaphor for Great Britain. Not, it's not super well known. It's not super common anymore. Back in the early 1900s and late 1800s, it was much more popular. Um, but both Uncle Sam and John Bull do seem to be carrying these various people over these rocks. And if you notice at the top, there does seem to be a giant temple or statue or, or perhaps a personification uh, that just straight up says civilization, right? At the very, very top. Um, Sabrina says, the way I interpret this is that the white men believe that other races can't survive without them. Well, that does seem, that's, that's not a bad interpretation. Um, notice one thing that always strikes, stands out to me is that they're, they're very strained posture, right? John Bull needs a cane. Uncle Sam is just like dripping sweat from his forehead. He's hunched over. And literally, if you, if you take a close look, these straps are literally around their necks. Like their, their neck and their back are bearing all the weight of, uh, of these baskets. If you just kind of take a close look of them. So when we talk about a burden, I think this, these, this comic does a very good job portraying the, the concept of burden or something that must be carried. Um, if you can look very closely, I don't know if you can zoom in on your computers and see, but each of these, um, each of these the individuals inside of, um, inside of the baskets all have um, uh, either easily identifiable features or they literally just have the name of the place that they're supposed to represent on their shirt. So for example, in the basket above the United States, it literally says Cuba. This, this middle figure here just says Cuba on their shirt. Um, and if you look, I believe this one says um, Samoa, which had recently become an American territory. And then if you look over on the English side, it, this, this gentleman, the, the turban literally says India on it. And this is fairly, a fairly recognizable personification of China. And the gentleman wearing the fez is supposed to represent um, Turkey or the Ottoman Empire. And, and yes, some of these, especially the ones that Uncle Sam is carrying, are quite, quite, quite stereotypical for the time. Um, not, not really taking a lot of effort to, to at least even be realistic in the cartoon. Uh, very stereotypical. And um, Dan's pointing out the burden of trying to help non-white civilize. As Tanya points out, not all Indians wear turbans. Yes, that is definitely true. Not all Indians wear turbans, hence the, the stereotype. Um, and so carrying these people, like literally physically carrying them up to civilization, right, is a burden. And one of the things to understand about when we say things like the white man's burden is, the idea is you literally can't put it down, even if you wanted to, even if you just wanted to throw it off and say, I don't want to do this anymore, you can't, right? And that's what's really interesting about this whole concept. And I think as somebody pointed out, the scramble for Africa would have been an excellent example of, of this idea at work. Nations scrambling to get territory in part because it's perceived as their duty to do so. Okay, um, let's see, Oops. a duplicate slide, let me just slip on through here. So the, the phrase white man's burden is also a poem. Again, I've linked it in the resources, we're not gonna go over it. Um, um, but it comes from Rudyard Kipling's poem in 1899. And 
the thing you have to understand about the poem, while, while I have heard it said that some people believe it is satirical in its advocacy for imperialism, um, this poem was written in the middle of the U.S. debate, in the middle of a debate within the United States about annexing the Philippines. And Rudy Kipling wrote the poem and sent it to the then President William McKinley and members of U.S. Congress uh, to try to convince them to go ahead and annex the Philippines as a colony, which they ended up doing. Um, and so this poem uh, would become a major kind of bit of justification, if you will, for, for imperialism throughout this time. After the Spanish-American War, that is correct. Uh, will we go over the scramble for Africa? We will, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about it, maybe not in super detail. Did the poem push imperialism throughout the world? Um, the poem was definitely an example of the idea of imperialism, and it was a very, it was a very popular poem. Uh, it received a lot of attention. And so imperialism, as we know, it had already been going on, but the poem represented sort of an easy to understand example of the ideas behind imperialism. So if you wanted to explain to somebody why it was that Europeans had to go out and make colonies, you could simply point them to the white man's bird and say, hey, read this poem. It'll, make, it'll all make sense when you read it. It was a very popular poem. It also, I might add, had a lot of rebuttals. There's a lot of, of counter poems out there such as The Black Man's Burden or Take Up the Black Man's Burden. Um, there's a lot of counter poems you could look up if you're curious. All right, any, any questions about that? Sort of racial ideologies? Okay, uh, we will continue then. So. Now we can talk a little bit about some military technology. Let's talk a little bit about military technology. Um, so one of the big things that made a lot of the conquest possible um, was this new technology that comes out of the Industrial Revolution, um, such as the big one is actually trains and railroads, but also industrially produced gu guns and cannons, as well as telegraph lines that make communication uh, easy and possible. Um, so you might recognize some of these. Um, but these things really changed the game. Like before, you know, building of weapons was limited because you had to have special skills to make cannons and make rifles. Now that a factory could produce cannons and rifles, it was much easier um, to build lots of cannons and lots of rifles and ships out of steam that could sail long distances, as well as the fact that coal, which was that legendary fuel of the Industrial Revolution, meant ships could sail against the wind and upriver, and it made essentially the, the, the expansion of Europe both militarily possible and logistically possible um, more than it ever had been before. Um, Dan asked a question about World War II and the vulnerability of Europeans. Yes. Oh, thank you, Melissa. So you got that. Um, yeah, we will. We'll talk about the end of the age of imperialism when we get to Unit Eight. Coal was the legendary fuel of the Industrial Revolution. That yeah, that is correct. That's true. Um, in particular, this this chart kind of breaks down how to think about the military technology. So, for example, in the pre-industrial age, you had very large distances you might have to conquer if you wanted to build an empire. Um, but in the industrial age with railroads, steamboats, uh, it actually became a lot easier um, to get where you were going. And it became easier to conquer. And we're gonna talk about a really good example of this in just a second um, in the form of, of Russia and India. In the pre-industrial age, Europeans' abilities to, to assert their control was limited. Uh, some of you might remember way back in Unit 4 talking about uh, the Portuguese Empire and how they were limited to coastal forts along the edges of India and the edges of Africa because they just didn't have enough people to physically go in and conquer um, these established states. Um, 
in the age of imperialism, you don't need to necessarily have a large army. If you have machine guns, cannons, and artillery um, used well and effectively, you don't necessarily need to have a large population of soldiers go in and do your conquest. And one of the things about the age of imperialism is that geographically speaking, this would be a great example of, of, the, of the first theme of humans in the environment, um, is that things that used to serve as barriers to entry or barriers to movement are not barriers anymore. Mountains can be crossed with trains, rivers can be gone up with steamboats. And so the Industrial Revolution really changes the game uh, because it destroys geographic barriers. Things that used to keep out European powers um, from, say, Central Africa now are not a barrier anymore. You can just get on a steamboat and you can sail up the Congo River or the Niger River or the Zambezi River or down the Nile River. And then you can just get into that new territory. Uh, why was Africa a major colonizing area for Europeans? And Tony says the resources. The resources were a big one, yes. That that may be one of the, the largest reasons was the resources. Rubber, though it is not only rubber, we'll talk about some other ones, but yeah. Rubber, I mean, so with Africa, yes, it was uh, it was definitely resources, but I, I would encourage you also not to forget that the social Darwinism and the white man's burden applied to Africa just as much as it applied anywhere else. So, something to think about. Um, two really good examples of railroads. Talk about railroads. If you need, to, if you have an essay about imperialism and the expansion of European powers, railways are perhaps one of your best go-to uh, examples. And probably the two famous ones um, would be the Trans-Siberian Railway in Russia that connects Moscow with the East, and part of it even runs through what is now China. Uh, as well as the British Railway Network in India, uh, which allowed it to really assert its control over the uh, the subcontinent of India, what is now India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh. Now, just out of curiosity, I'm gonna throw this question out to you guys. Why might it be, how, how would railroads equate with imperial control? How, how does building a railroad suddenly mean you have more control over over your territory? Palm oil and rubber, yes. We'll, we will talk about resources, don't worry, that's next. Tony says goods and people, Dakota says communication. Another person says you can ship more military and gather resources faster, that's true. Larry says that there's a type of rebellion, you could move your soldiers faster. You can transport goods faster and more efficiently. Yes, all, all of those completely uh, correct answer. Um, Dan had a clarifying question. Before the Industrial Revolution, were horses being used in an attempt to, to assert authority over Africa? Um, oh, yeah, so Dan, Dan is referring to the fact that uh, horses were susceptible in Central Africa to, um, I think it, it was the tsetse fly, which is also humans are susceptible to. Um, uh, and so this is why horses were um, unable to, to effectively be used in Central Africa. And fun fact, also in, in what is now India, uh, horses, it's very hard to breed horses and raise horses in India and keep horses alive uh, in India in the pre-modern age which is why almost every outside force that's ruled India via, via the use of horses, such as uh, the Delhi Sultans and the Mughals, all came from outside of the region. They came from, they came from Central Asia, or they came from Iran, or they came from Afghanistan. Uh, and they always, had to, they always had to get horses from back in those places. They had to go, they had to send people to Central Asia to bring horses down to what is now India to help keep their control over the subcontinent because it's very hard to raise horses in South Asia. And the climate is not particularly good for it. Uh, somebody's pointing out that diseases affected European expansion into Africa and it's caused Africans to be colonized later. 
uh, than it should have been. Yes, that's a good way to put it. And one of the things, it's not listed in the slides, but it is somewhat of an important example, would be something called quinine. And it's a plant that grows in South America that was discovered by the Spanish, I believe. Quinine is a malaria vaccine that allowed Europeans to spend longer amounts of time in Africa um, than they used to be able to because it made them less susceptible to malaria. So that's quinine. That's that's actually a pretty good example of a of a changing technology. Um, what else? I was going to add something onto the quinine thing. Um, the other important thing. Oh, sorry. The, the the an example of just how bad malaria used to be. Um, the Portuguese colonies that were located in San Tomé, like just off the coast of what is now Congo. Um, had some of the highest mortality rates of any Portuguese colony for the colonizers because malaria and yellow fever were so high. Um, Portuguese would literally send prisoners there and expect them to not come back, um, as well as the, the people, undesirables in their society. So people who wouldn't convert to Christianity usually got sent to San Tomé to do work and were expected to die. That's how potent malaria was. Uh, bu, 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 oh, questions about colonizing. Uh, who colonized Africa first? Well, it depends on how you define colonization. If you literally just mean taking territory, then we're going all the way back to 14, 1415 uh, with the Portuguese. But if, if Dan's pointing out, the, or if Tanya's pointing out the Dutch, that's the first, what we call a settler colony, where the people actually come in in large numbers and establish a naturally reproducing population. That would be the Cape Colony. That's true. Would disease be a factor that determines colonization? Uh, it would be a contributing factor. I don't know if you could say it's the whole thing or not the whole thing, but it would definitely be a contributing factor, the speed of which slowed down or sped up. Something to keep in mind. It may be the thing that holds up the human colonization of Mars. Who knows what's out on Mars, right? We may be talking about this in 100 years, you know, human colonization of Mars slowed because of an unknown disease. It's amazing what the small microbes can do to shape the course of human history. If you think of the Black Death. Anywho, when we talk about guns, um, we're talking about machine guns. There is an, a very important example that you can point to. Yeah, I think it's probably the greatest example of just how much of an impact Maxim guns and, and effective artillery have in, in shaping the course of imperialism. It's the Battle of Omdurman, and it took place in what is now the Sudan in 1898. Interestingly enough, the same year the U.S. annexed or took over the Philippines. Um, in this case, you had a, a movement in Sudan called the Mahdist Movement. Um, it, was a, it was a religious political movement, but it opposed British influence in Egypt, and it also opposed the Egyptians who seemed to be um, co-opted by the British. And so it sought, to, it sought to drive the Egyptians and the British out of Sudan, which it did for about 10 years. Um, but at this particular battle, the British were trying to reassert their control, and they came with about 8,000 British soldiers and another 9,000 Egyptian British trained soldiers and went up against 52,000 Sudanese mice. So almost a four to one ratio, almost a four, about three and a half to one ratio, which is pretty insane. Um, the British brought along a number of Maxim guns as well as um, accurate and contemporary artillery. And by the end of the day, um, you had almost half of the force of Mahdists either being captured or killed, and only 300 British and Egyptian soldiers wounded uh, or killed. Um, and so, is this a must-know concept? Is this a, well, so, no, well, I don't, I would be skeptical if this battle would ever come up on a multiple choice question, but what I'm saying about this battle is that it is a good example of how technology is a game changer in imperialism. That's what I'm, this is, this is one of the go-to examples of military technology as a game changer. If this had been a hundred years earlier, uh, you know, the British and Egyptians probably would not have won that battle without Maxim guns and artillery. They, they probably would have been overrun if they were using 1700s technology. So that's the point. Um, 
that's the point that that I so I bring up this battle. And just a recap on social Darwinism. No, it looks like you guys got it. Okay. All right. Um, so that's the technology. Any questions about technology specific? I see there's a question about social Darwinism, and it looks like you guys got it. Yes, the idea that there is a hierarchy in civilization, right? That there's a civilizational hierarchy, and the Europeans are at the top of the civilizational hierarchy, and everybody else is below the civilizational hierarchy. But not only that, there's there's the white man's burden aspect of it, which is that you know, people, Europeans have a duty, a burden, if you will, to go out and uh, colonize and, and, and bring these people to civilization via colonization. Okay, then let's really quick practice. Just um, we'll go ahead and just just because we're a little crunched for time, we'll go ahead and do. Um, well, I'll let you guys pick one. So this is a document. Um, from an, it was a modified document from an old DBQ. Um, and it has to do with trains uh, in West Africa. And so it's a French governor, and he's talking about necessary conditions for achieving their goal of civilization. And so my two questions for you is if you look at this, the first one is, why do the French control West Africa as described by the document? And then another one, the second question is B part, is simply asking you to consider um, what it is that another, another factor that could potentially explain why they have control in West Africa. And so go ahead and, you know, since, since we don't have a lot of, we don't have time to type full out explanations, um, go ahead and just, for A and B, let's just go ahead and identify some possible causes that are both hinted at in the document as well as th that you know in general from your own study. So you can just go ahead and throw those up in chat. So there was, let's, let's take a look at a few of these. Dutch control, so the previously established notions of Africa, transportation improvements, civilization, Dan, I think you're getting at the civilization. The drive for resources, new technology. Oh, British control of the Gold Coast. Now that's a good one. That's a good one. Because this French West Africa is just north of the Gold Coast. So nationalism and political rivalries. That's that's a very good one. That is a good one. And political rivalries. The British and the French did almost go to war over both Egypt at one point and then Cameroon at another point. And it was these almost going to war moments that eventually resulted in a very important conference. Do you know what conference I'm referring to? This conference would definitely be a term that you might see on a test. The Berlin Conference, yeah. Funny thing, we call it the Berlin Conference. It was actually called the Congo Conference because it was in it was uh, in Germany. It was Congo with a K and Conference with a K. So, 1884, to prevent things like war from happening between the imperial powers. Awesome, cool. So, a few potential things you could point out. Um, as I think it was Dan pointed out, the idea of social Darwinism, they talked about civilization in that document a lot. Um, so, they talked about opening up civilization and economic development. Um, they talk about soldiers. Um, as somebody pointed out, the um, 
British controlled Gold Coast was very important, uh, as well as the use of railroads, which may have already existed, and that was why they were being advocated for. So you notice that he says that we need railroads, but maybe there were already railroads somewhere else. So they were just advocating for their improvement. Um, somebody was asking about Ethiopia. Ethiopia, who controlled Ethiopia? Well, uh, the Solomonic dynasty. <laughs> no, um, no European power pre-World War II, um, or I should say pre-1933, um, took control of all of Ethiopia. Um, the British did launch an expedition in, I think it was 1820, against what is now Ethiopia, because the Ethiopian king kidnapped several British ambassadors. Um, and the British you know, sent an expeditionary force in there to capture the, the capital and rescue the ambassadors and then just leave because they didn't want to, uh, they didn't want to start a colony. This was early pre scramble for Africa. So, but uh, there, there, no one dominated Ethiopia during this time. They're the, they're the famous exception. How many sentences would you recommend for a good SAQ? Um, that is a great question. Has anybody heard of the acronym ACE by any chance? Capital A C E. I'm gonna just put it in the chat really quick. I'll put in the chat the recommended sentences per. So my suggestion in, to my students is no less than three, and you really don't want to do more than four, because then you're, you're, you're taking up precious time. So anywhere from two to four. Two to four is my recommendation. Um, if any of you, I think this is an AP biology term. Um, a, a colleague of mine just told me about it this week. It's called CERT, C-E-R-T. I'm not, I don't remember what it stands for, but I remember that it, it's very similar to ACE, it's used in AP Bio. Um, CERT, C-E-R-T, Some, has something to do, it's very similar to ACE, uh, but that's two to four sentences, that's a good. So each of these, well, part B would be two to four sentences. Part one, for the very first part of your SAQs that just say identify, you really could just write one sentence where you just identify the cause. Um, you wouldn't have to write three to four sentences. Maybe was it assertion, commentary, evidence? Oh, oh that was a case. Um, don't we need ACE for all the questions? Yes, so A and then B and then C. So ACE for A, ACE for B, ACE for C. Although, again, if it just says identify, you could probably get away with just the A part, just the answering and citing, the A part. You wouldn't need the C part if it just says identify. Okay, cool. Uh, are there any questions about military technology or technology in general in the Imperial Age? Dan's asking about Liberia. Yeah, Eric's got that one. Yeah, it was sort of a protector to the US. So fun fact, there's actually a Liberian restaurant near where I used to live and if you, if you were to go to this Liberian restaurant, they have the presidents of Liberia painted on the wall. Um, and the funny thing is the first four presidents of Liberia were all born in Virginia. They were freed slaves from Virginia who went back to Liberia uh, to help run this colony. So, uh, What was the most impactful military weapon? That seems like a good topic of discussion. Um, military weapon would probably be the Gatling gun or the, the Maxim gun. But you could make the case for telegraph lines, uh, railroads, and gunboats, right? Control of the seas. You could make a case for all of them. So I would say maybe just pick the one you want to go with on your essay, potentially, if you've got to talk about the causes of imperialism. Just pick the one that you think you know the best. All righty. Then let's talk really quick about the drive for resources. And so. I'm going to zoom in on four resources here. Uh, there are others. There, there's a couple others as well. Um, but this is a little chart that kind of breaks down where the resources were found, where they mostly went to, and why they were um, mined and where they were sent to. 
And so we've already pointed out rubber and palm oil, both of which were super important for industrial production, right? Prior to um, the easy available abil availability, sorry, easy easy availability of um, the easy availability of, of of oil oil from under the ground. Palm oil was the best thing we we had in order to make industrial machines run. So it was very helpful. And so while this this lovely chart will tell you things, uh, I think it might help to visualize it a little bit. So I've created a little map that kind of shows where everything was coming from and where most of it ended up going. And so the two major sources of cotton during this time that were outside of the United States uh, were Egypt as well as India. And the two major sources of rubber at this time uh, were the Congo. And then a little bit later, uh, it would be Southeast Asia. Eventually, in the early 1900s, um, rubber was transplanted successfully into Southeast Asia, what's now Malaysia and uh, in Indonesia. Isn't guano only found in South America because the poop doesn't get wet and washed out and stays dry so it can be fertilized? Yes, that's true. Um, and there were also a few islands in the Pacific where that condition also existed. So yes, South America, Chile specifically, um, but there are a few Pacific islands out there that also had large deposits of guano. Guano is really interesting. If you were just looking at the history of South America, it would be fascinating because there were at least two wars and a naval arms race, almost entirely fueled by the desire for guano. So guano has actually played an incredibly interesting part in the history of just that region in and of itself. So guano is interesting. But before synthetic fertilizers were invented, a guano was really the only way to boost your crop production. So um, anyways, uh, rubber in Brazil, I, you know, I think that only happened in the later 1950s. I could be completely wrong, but I recall that the transplant of rubber to Brazil didn't happen until much later than even the transplant from rubber from the Congo over to Indonesia. Uh, is guano the best organic fertilizer today? That's a good question. I'm not entirely sure what the best organic fertilizer is today. Guano was popular though, um, because it was easy to transport. You could, just, you could saw it into blocks and put it on a ship and send it. Um, so it was very easy to do. We're gonna talk about that in like just a, a little bit more about that in just a second. But what I hope you can see from this map what kind of is clear about this map is that a lot of the resources that made the industrial world possible, lubrication, raw materials, fertilizer for food, a lot of these resources come from what we call the global south, from Africa, from India, uh, from the Pacific. And do you notice where most of these resources are coming from? How many of them are coming from places that are actually colonized uh, by European powers? Basically all of them, not entirely all of them, but yes, basically all of them. Um, like the exceptions might be Chile, uh, which was not officially colonized by anybody at this time, although it was under heavy British influence, financial influence. Um, yeah, so let me go ahead and jump over. One other thing to note when we talk about economic domination and the drive for resources is that it wasn't always pure colonization. Uh, there is a very famous fruit company called the United Fruit Company, which is the reason why bananas are so popular in the United States. And the full history of that company is just is just fascinating. And I've included a stream, um, sorry, a stream. I've included a podcast in the resources for the stream that can sort of help. You can you can listen to it. It's about an hour long if you have the time. But it will, it will give you kind of the, the rundown of how the United Fruit Company, which just started by importing bananas into the United States, eventually became sort of the East India Company of the American hemisphere, right? And basically ran several Central American governments for many years in the early 1900s and the late 1800s. Um, and so economic domination is sort of like America's colonization. So America did not go out and conquer uh, Nigeria, uh, I'm sorry, America didn't conquer Nicaragua, America didn't conquer Honduras, 
America did not uh, go occupy Guatemala, um, but the United Fruit Company did. And if the United Fruit Company ever had a problem with the governments in Nicaragua or Guatemala, um, then they would uh, pretty much just ask the U.S. government to help them out. And we would send, and by we, I mean the U.S. government, would send the Marines uh, to occupy that country until it agreed to do whatever the United Fruit Company wanted. Um, it's very important. Uh, it, it's, it's something to understand. The U.S. may never have had much of a colonial empire before the 1890s, uh, but the United Fruit Company definitely was a colonial empire in two of itself. Uh, didn't the Dole Company help take over Hawaii? Yes, the Dole Company played a fairly large role in the overthrow of Queen Lolikikani uh, of Hawaii. Didn't, they didn't totally do it all by themselves, but they played a pretty big role. So, uh, econ imperialism also takes on the form of economic domination. Um, here's a multiple choice question. We'll just go ahead and throw this. Uh, using this lovely picture right here, which is a tin that was used to transport and sell tea in Great Britain around the 1890s. Tusker tea brand. And uh, Pekoi is a kind of tea that's grown in um, what's now Sri Lanka. And so if you were to look at this lovely tea brand um, and you were to guess what a historian could best use the following image uh, to explain... Uh, the consequences of European imperialism, what would you say? Would it be the increase in the calorie consumption of the average European, the decline in traditional farming methods across Africa, the increase in the international trade of luxury goods, or the increase in the standards of living of the people of South Asia? So let's see. What does D say or what does D mean? Uh, D would mean that people in South Asia had a better life. And that can be seen, South Asia being India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, um, because of this particular, what we could infer based on this T tin. Now let's see, we got C, C, D, C, C, C. Uh, yes. And so the answer is indeed C. So the increase in the international trade of luxury goods. So we talk about the drive for resources, right? Rubber, guano, palm oil, the things you need to kind of build an industrial society. Um, but then there's also industrial demand for luxury goods like tea, things that you don't necessarily need to live, but they're really nice, like coffee. I don't need coffee to live. I drink two cups of it every day, though, because I really like it. If anyone out there is also a coffee addict. Please let me know. Um, so that's the thing about the increase in international goods. And that kind of goes with, um, that goes with what we were talking about earlier with the companies who exploit um, the regions for profit. So like the United Fruit Company, you don't need bananas to live, but bananas are really nice and they are somewhat good for you. So, you know, this, this idea of, internationally traded luxury goods on a scale not previously seen. Dan asks, is an ivory used for medicine? There are some, um, there are some traditional medicines in parts of Asia that call for the use of ivory as, um, as a medicine. Uh, I'm not entirely sure which parts of Asia this tradition is common, um, but it, it, there are parts of Asia where their ivory is viewed as traditional medicine. Was an ivory a major trade in the Indian Ocean? Yes, pre- it, actually, right even up until this time, ivory was a major trade product in the Indian Ocean. That's true. Famously, I think John Green in one of his videos points out that ivory sword handles were a really big deal in medieval China. And so ivory from Africa to medieval China was a really was a really popular demand in the 1200s, 1300s, 1400s. So really quick, now that we've covered some of the causes, I just want to quick talk about one consequence since the age of imperialism is also the age of migration. I just want to talk about one consequence, which is what we call the age of migration. Um, we're going to quick, we are running a little crunch for time. We're going to go a little over, um, but I want to talk about migration because it is a big part of this age. In fact, you, such a big deal that you could almost argue that this is in fact an age of migration primarily and only secondarily an age of, uh, an age of imperialism. 
And so why so much migration during this time? Well, some of that new technology we talked about really made, um, really made migration easier and possible. Um, in Europe, the population grew very rapidly because of, sorry about that, the population grew really rapidly because of the Industrial Revolution, raised li living standards. And networks of production around the world for things like tea, for things like railroads, for things like sugar, meant that labor was needed in other places that it previously did not exist. And so you might be wondering, what about slavery? Especially when we talk about networks of production, right? Well, what about slavery? And one of the things to understand is that by this time, by the early 1800s, the British had abolished the slave trade. And because they had the most powerful navy, that meant pretty much everybody else had to abolish the slave trade. Didn't mean slavery itself was abolished. That came a little bit later, 1820s for most European powers, 1860s for the United States, and then the 1880s for Brazil. But the thing about abolishing slavery in the Indian Ocean, in the Atlantic trade, is that you can get rid of slavery, um, but you still have the demand for the goods and you still need the labor. You still need a source of labor. That doesn't go away. You just need a new population. Um, somebody's asking about demographic profile. So a demographic profile basically means, in this case, um, people are living longer and having fewer, uh, fewer, sorry, not having fewer children. People are living longer and more children are not dying in childbirth. So that's why Europe's population is growing a lot during this time. Um, so really quick, if you've taken American history in the ninth grade or the eighth grade, or maybe you're taking it concurrently, uh, you might be familiar with the the melting pot, the, the story of, of Europeans migrating to the United States. And that is true, that's a big part of it, um, but that is only a small part of it. And one of the things that it's really important to understand in a global age of migration is that the, the, the Atlantic crossing of like Germany to the United States, like my own grandfather did, um, is a very small part, it's, it's only about a little over a third of all the migration that was going on in the world right now. And on the left here, what I've provided is sort of a nice table about where exactly people were going to at this time and, and sort of the number estimate of people who moved there. Uh, this, was, this was definitely one of the first large scale ages of migration in human history. Uh, Eric has very kindly uh, pointed out that population growth can equal migration. And that's definitely one of the reasons. Uh, but I would like to point out that there are a few other reasons why people migrate. So economic migrants to the United States, as well as settlers in the United States, as well as settlers in Australia or New Zealand, were definitely a result of population pressure. Um, but one of the reasons that people migrated was also because of the demand for labor in certain places. So remember we talked about how guano could be mined out of the ground in Chile. They needed a source of laborers to do this. And so while a lot of Americans associate Chinese labor with the railroads in the 1800s in the United States, there were also quite a few Chinese working in Chile in the guano mines, some of whom came willingly, uh, signed a contract and, and came on over to work. Others were kidnapped and forced to come work. Um, and so the demand for labor is also a really big reason for the types of migration that you see. Yes, it was about America, uh, um, Europeans moving to America for a better life, but it was also about a world that demanded more goods and the need for labor to produce those goods. It's a very important distinction to draw. I, uh, I do, uh, I spent about two days talking about this with my students about how we, you know, in the United States, we're familiar with the, what we would call the traditional migration narrative, but that it actually gets a little more complicated when you look at it from a global perspective. Um, but, 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 was this on the 2003 test? That's a good question. Um, interesting. I'm not sure if this is on the 2003 test. I want to zoom in on one 
particular case study. This is the last thing, and then I'll let you all go. Um, I want to zoom in on one particular case study because I think this case study does an excellent job of tying in everything with technology, imperialism, uh, the demand for labor. This really, I think this particular case study um, really pulls it all together. So in the late 1890s, um, a British company called the East Africa Company wanted to build a railroad that would connect the Great Lakes region of Africa with the coast in what's now modern uh, Tanzania and parts of Kenya. And this railroad needed a lot of labor. And so what the British East Africa Company did was they went to what's now India and they recruited lots of workers to come and help build this railroad. Uh, I think by some estimates, somewhere up to 20,000 workers were, came over from, from what's now India and Pakistan and Bangladesh uh, to work on this railroad. And it was a very diverse bunch. You had Muslims, you had Sikhs, you had Hindus, everybody came. And the story of building the railroad is, is a story all in of itself. Uh, it was called the Lunatic Express because it was building it was insane, insanely dangerous. Um, you had extreme weather, you had diseases, and in, in one case, you had two lions that liked to eat people, um, referred to as the man-eating lions of Savo, which is where they, the lions themselves were from, and the railway just went through like a stretch of that territory. Um, sounds like a novel. It is a novel, and it's a play, and it's also a movie. It's a movie called The Ghost in the Darkness. I think it came out in 1989, 1988. I, and if I'm remembering, it has a very young Matthew McConaughey as one of the, 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 the Europeans working on the railroad trying to hunt the lions who seem to, to always know when like a worker is alone and not with anybody. So that's the ghost in the darkness. Yes, the ghost and the darkness. Those are the names of the lions. And if I believe, I could be mistaken about this, I believe the lions themselves are actually on display at the Chicago Metropolitan Museum. You can go you can go see them, they're stuffed there. Um, so if anyone in here is near Chicago or in that area, you can go see the ghost in the darkness themselves. It is a it is a good movie though, it's an entertaining, it's a very entertaining movie. Um, so this case study is really interesting. So you have an imperial project, an imperial project to build a railway to facilitate economic trade between interior Africa and the coast. And it involved the movement of a large number of peoples, specifically from South Asia to East Africa. And those peoples, a lot of them actually did stay there until the 1970s uh, in Kenya and Uganda and Tanzania. You had a very large population of people who were descended from people from South Asia. They were in these countries, they're just referred to as Asians, uh, but their, their families were usually from India or Pakistan or Bangladesh. Uh, until the 1970s, you had a very large uh, group um, uh, of people there. And so this case study, I think, really ties together the, the, the how migration is connected to imperialism and how one is a consequence of the other, but one is also a cause of the other. Imperialism is a cause of migration, uh, but migration can also be uh, help further the cause of imperialism through gigantic labor projects like this one. Um, I'll throw out another example, just in case there's any contemporary music fans here. Uh, if you like the, the, the I think R&B is technically her genre, the R&B singer Nicki Minaj is pretty popular. Uh, her family is also, she has some, some of her family come, came from South Asia a long time ago, although she is from a small island in, in the Caribbean called Trinidad. Uh, and that is because large numbers of South Asian workers, again, the same people that came to Kenya, same same area, uh, also went to British colonies in the Caribbean to grow sugar. And so um, the demand for sugar by an industrializing Europe led to this mass migration of peoples. Anywho, all righty, that's all of the material content. Um, and are there any questions about that? I'm just going to wrap it on up after this with some things that teachers can do with their students in the classroom. The ghost dance movement. Oh, that, oh, the ghost dance movement. That was a Native American movement in the 1890s. Uh, it was a religious movement. The idea was that 
uh, if Native Americans performed a certain ritual dance at a certain time and also followed certain rules, uh, that the white man, the Europeans would uh, disappear. It wasn't really exactly clear how the Europeans would disappear or, or the Americans would disappear, um, but the, the prophet uh, Wakova, who, who kind of is credited with starting the ghost dance, basically said that if we do this dance, we Native Americans do the dance, um, then the white man will disappear and the buffalo will come back and everything will be as it was. So, anyways, so last thing, just some suggested activities for teachers, something that I've done in years past with my students um, would be to simply map the major migrations. I know that if you have uh, Bentley and Ziegler, chapter 32 has a really good map of the migrations. Uh, if not, you can do some, um, you could have students draw it, you could give them origins and destinations um, to show the wide range of movement of peoples. It's good for visualization. You can do that individually, you can do it as a group, you can attach essential questions to it. Um, it's just one possible activity. Uh, that's um, chapter 32 in the Traditions and Encounters book. Um, you can also, something I did this year, uh, was be to look at some primary source documents about migration. Um, you can talk about, um, compare like the, ex the experience of indentured servants um, with the experience of settlers. Uh, and you can use this as an opportunity to practice some document analysis. Uh, and last but not least, you can just go ahead and compare them. Um, so it's good practice in uh, causation. So you can talk about the movement of laborers for imperial projects versus the movement of settlers to Australia and New Zealand who are looking for more opportunities. So these are just some, some tips for teachers um, that you can use in your classrooms if you wanna talk about migration. And so that's all I got for you. I can stick around for a few more minutes if anybody has some questions. Thank you all for sticking around. I know we went a little over time, but uh, you know, my first stream back in a while, so a little rusty. Um, so I'll stick around for another minute if there's some questions, and I will thank anyone else who wants to leave. Thank you for coming. Have a good night, and don't forget to, to come back next time. Digital questions, questions, questions. Oh, so Dan has a question. The Xhosa cattle killing movement. Um, so the cattle killing movement was another example of a religiously inspired movement. So wh how, why it's usually compared to the ghost dance is because they were both religiously inspired. Um, I don't know all the details. I mean, if I looked it up, I could find the details. But the short version of it was a, pr a young woman who was a member of the Xhosa tribe in Southern Africa had a vision that said that if they, they the Hosha tribe, killed their cattle, which were very important to the tribe, they were like a cattle herding society. If they killed their cattle, it would trigger an event that would drive out the European settlers who had come to that part of Africa. So it was very similar to, it was very, or well, let me rephrase. I believe it wouldn't drive out the European settlers. It would bring about the end of days. It would bring about sort of the, the end of time. If I'm remembering the details correctly, I'm not entirely up on that one. But the reason why it's usually put with the ghost dance is because it was religiously inspired. So I hope, Dan, that answers your question on that front. Yes, this, is, this was definitely, Eric is right, this was definitely a very lively chat. One was prophesized and one was a vision. I think it was probably fair to say visions were involved in both, but I think, and again, you may need to look up the details for the Chosa movement yourself, the cattle killing movement yourself, but I believe that it was not, a that that one may have been lacking in a prophet, but I know that Kova for the ghost dance, uh, he was he was kind of an, an accepted prophet. He, people acknowledged him as, as a prophet. Um, let's see, I can take another 30 seconds. Dan's got a question about China and Russian revolutionaries. 
Oh, that's an interesting one. Um, after 1900, I'll give you a few things. I can give you something to work with. Um, I would say that the Chinese Revolution was, but well, okay, so let's talk some similarities. Um, both of these revolutions were against autocratic rule. Uh, the Tsar in Russia and the Emperor in China were both autocratic systems. They were they were absolute monarchies. Um, some differences you could point to would be that Russia was involved in a world war that had led to great stress on their society. Um, and China was not involved in World War I to the extent that Russia was. Um, Russia was not being dominated by foreign powers like China was. That's really where the stress on Chinese society came from, would be the constant incursion of Europeans, the, the port treaties, the unequal treaties, and the spheres of influence. So that's like a difference you could look at. And you could also look at the, the, the outcomes, right? The establishment of the Soviet Union in Russia, and then the, the, the sort of civil war that goes on for a good 30 years in China after the revolution. So um, I'll let you find the details uh, yourself on, on some of those. I hope that answers your question. Anywho, alrighty. Well, I'm gonna go get going. Thank you so much to everyone who attended, and I hope you have a wonderful rest of your nights, wherever you might be.